Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Red Menace. We want to introduce the fact that we're actually moving to a new show structure, and, and this has always been something we've been very open and honest about from the very beginning of the, the creation of this show, was that this show was an evolving thing. We were going to try some different things, see what worked, um, see what people were interested in, constantly sort of adjust the, the structure and the focus of the show, depending on feedback from listeners, and obviously just the political and economic events exploding all around us. And so what we've decided to do at this point is to move away from a strictly theory deep dive show into an alternating month-by-month sort of show where one month we will do theory deep dives and next month we'll be doing the critique of the gotha program by marx but then every other month we will um, do basically current events we'll cover the big news and political events happening in society and we think this would be not only interesting to more people maybe broaden the the range of people that are interested in our show but also sort of have this back and forth between engaging with a political theory and and doing those deep dives and then the next month we'll be applying what we've learned to the current conditions and it's really taking that idea that we've had from the beginning of taking political theory and then applying it to our conditions it's really taking that idea and expanding it and and, and creating a new show structure so this month we'll be doing um, current events we'll be talking about the right-wing protests, an update on the coronavirus, the state of the economy, organizing efforts, etc. Next month, we'll go back to uh, theory and we'll do critique of the Gotha program. The following month, we'll do news and, and events and then back to theory. So this back and forth structure is the new structure for now. Um, things are always open to change. We're always trying to evolve uh, with the times and with our audience base. So just letting everybody know that. But if you've already started on critique of, of Gotha program or already even finished it in anticipation for our next episode, fear not. It'll just be next month that we can engage with that text. So, um, yeah, we wanted to announce it up front. We have a lot to cover today, um, but just to start it out, uh, I like to kind of check in. So, Allison, basically, how are you doing so far? Uh, what's the situation with where you live and the lockdown and, and just how are you doing sort of psychologically? Yeah, so I think I'm doing as well as I can under uh, the current lockdown. So in LA, um, things are still, you know, the the outbreak here hasn't gotten as bad as it has in cities like New York, but we're still, you know, we've been floating at around 50 to 100 deaths a day. So that's been fairly consistent and it hasn't dropped off yet. Uh, It seems like social distancing here has actually been working fairly well in terms of controlling things. So it's not as horrific as it is in some parts of the country, which I'm thankful for. So, you know, just getting used to being inside all the time and what that means and trying to find ways to stay productive. Uh, So far, managed to stay fairly busy, I think, between this and organizing and adopting a dog that takes a bunch of time (laughs) to take care of. So a lot of stuff going on that I think is keeping me busy and keeping me sane a little bit during all of this. And again, things are not as horrific in L.A. as elsewhere, which I think has helped some. But we'll see how things go, obviously, going forward. How are you doing over uh, where you're at? Yeah, no, um, similar in the sense that we're obviously not being hit as hard as um, some of the other cities, especially the sort of epicenter of New York City. Uh, Nebraska is actually one of the eight states, uh, Republican states, that have not issued an actual lockdown. So uh, we were one of the earlier states when it came to shutting down schools. And there was an early and still ongoing um, standard that said you can't have, you know, a group of 10 or more gathering. But there's no lockdown. There's no police enforcement of a lockdown or anything like that. So people are are being safe, but you still see people walking around the neighborhood. A lot of people now um, were going fishing and, and going to, like, public parks because there's no lockdown. There's very few things to do. So you go out into a public park and do recreational activities. That's sort of been closed down. So, like, some of the main parks have have been closed down. There's no like camping allowed in a lot of the places where I, I've camped before. Um, so between organizing, working on the two shows, having two kids that are at home all the time now, um, it, it's been interesting. It's it's fine. I mean, I actually, there is this silver lining of just being able to reconnect with, spend more time with my kids. Um, you know, we, we built a big fort in the living room and, you know, <laughs> it's kind of fun to do those things that otherwise you just, you're just so caught up in the daily rhythms of life that, you know, your kids are at school, you're at work, you come home, you see them for a few hours, they go to bed. Um, so it's nice to kind of do that. And then I've also had an opportunity to, to expand what I've been trying to, to do broadly, which is um, fishing and hunting. I've been getting, I went on my first turkey hunt last uh, weekend um, and I've been fishing a lot more. And those are things that I've always been interested in and I have a lot more time to do now. So Overall, things are okay, um, but again, it, it's really dependent on sort of where you live, 
what the statutes in your city are, how intense the lockdown is, et cetera. So all things considered, I'm in one of the better placed uh, areas in, in the country to to not have an overwhelming uh, tidal wave of, of coronavirus deaths and, and whatnot. I'm very jealous that you're able to get out and do camping, hunting, and fishing still, because LA has shut down the Angeles National Forest, basically, and the Santa Monica Mountains, so all of our outdoors options are basically closed at the moment over here. Damn, yeah. Silver lining, I guess, of living in a deep red state that doesn't uh, <laughs> right. take lockdown seriously. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and, and get into events, and I, and I think the best way is to just catch people up on uh, the basic facts, the empirical data of, of where the coronavirus is, what the projections are now. Um, I, I know we, we talked last time when we covered this topic, we were operating off the Imperial College report. That was sort of a worst case scenario if the government does nothing or if the people don't do social distancing, etc. And so I was hoping, Allison, maybe you could just catch people up on where the um, empirical scientific and medical expert ideas and projections are around the, the virus at the moment. Yeah, so yeah, we were working off the Imperial College models last time. And again, the thing to emphasize is that those models were mostly looking at if social distancing was not well enforced. And for the most part, I think it's worth saying social distancing in the US, despite um, sort of the kind of unevenness that you would expect from 50 states trying to coordinate it without much federal guidance that means anything, has been working fairly successfully. So the worst case scenario models that we were looking at in the short term for the Imperial College probably are not where we're on now. And I say that in the hopes of maybe like sounding a little bit optimistic here, but I also think that we need to recognize that social distancing, just because it is working, doesn't mean that we can't slip back into those particularly bad models. Um, especially given some of the data that we're looking at. So social distancing is working, but already today we're seeing some states that are rolling it back, South Carolina and Georgia being big examples, and Texas is moving to roll it back as well. Texas uh, has maybe a slightly more reasonable plan than some of those other states, where rolling back social distancing right now will just look like opening more retail and allowing curbside pickup. But in states like Georgia, we are looking at reopening movie theaters, reopening retail, restaurants, and just letting people interact with each other again. So already, you know, I think even though social distancing is working, we need to recognize that we could fall back into these bad models if we have states acting in this manner uh, irresponsibly. So the White House numbers that they're working off are only predicting 60,000 deaths, and you may have seen this in headlines over and over again, but a few things to keep in mind in terms of those numbers is that those come from models that only predict out to the end of August, so not nearly as long as most experts are saying this pandemic is likely to last, which is as long as it would take for us to get a vaccine. And then also in terms of the vaccines, I know last time we talked about the 18-month uh, prediction that Fauci gave, but a really good New York Times article looking into this also pointed out that that would actually be a very optimistic guess and that there's been no vaccine development for something on this scale that has occurred faster than two years before. So we would be breaking a record if we got that 18 months. So even though the models coming out of the White House do look fairly optimistic in terms of the total death count compared to earlier models, they're not projecting very far out and they're not considering what happens after August when we don't have a vaccine. So one thing I think that we should be thinking about then is the possibility that even if if we get the virus under control, if we relax our controls of it, there's very likely to be a second wave that can happen. Uh, there's a meme going around sort of about the Spanish flu blaming the second wave on a lack of social distancing. And while that's not quite true, the second wave did sort of start because of the end of World War One and increased interaction of people and soldiers coming back home. So it does still demonstrate to a certain extent how when you have a massive pandemic, resuming normal life in some way can lead to a second outbreak. And that could happen very likely if the U.S. were to release, uh, you know, on social distancing too soon. One way we know that that would likely be a problem that the New York Times also talks about is the fact that China is starting to see cases pop up again. So China did a really interesting thing. They basically did contact tracing and mass testing in order to make sure that they could have 14 days without, you know, a new infection being detected. And 14 days is the incubation period. And when they got 14 days without being detected, they reopened some public businesses and allowed uh, for life to sort of go back to normal. And as anticipated from all the models, including the Imperial College model, now we 
we are seeing a uptick in cases that are coming in China again, something that China probably expected. What most health experts are talking about is on-again, off-again social distancing, where we might have a month of social distancing, a month without it, which would allow these small waves to happen, which wouldn't overwhelm healthcare capacity. So China, we're seeing sort of that model playing out in a way that is fairly expected with what we've looked at so far. So what does the future look like in terms of projections, I think? Uh, the optimistic one is that the U.S. can maybe organize that on-again, off-again model, and we can ride this out with small waves until we get to a vaccine. Uh, the main problem there is that in order to do that, we would probably need to train uh, several tens of thousands of people to do contact tracing. We would need to have a mass infrastructure of temperature checks and testing, both for antibodies and for the virus itself. And currently, we don't have that. And some of the states in our 50-state countries are already basically giving up and reopening instead of coming up with these comprehensive plans. So the ability for us to make a centralized response like China is not necessarily likely. So where do things go from here? It's hard to say. It depends on whether or not a unified response can happen, which I'm skeptical of, and how states individually respond. But it's very possible that even though we've had some success, we could slip back into a very dangerous situation very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the sort of cruel ironies of, of this entire situation is that the more people take the the threat seriously, the more they social distance, the more um, governments or state governments impose lockdowns and, and, and shut down, you know, huge swaths of the economy, you know, the lower the number comes, but then the, the more opportunity there is for right wingers and reactionaries and, you know, ruling class proxies to then point at those lower than expected numbers and say, see, we're overreacting. Um, the problem's not that big. Initially, you know, the reports were, we're, we're talking a million or two million dead Americans. Now we're only talking uh, 60,000 through the end of the summer. Therefore, this is really overhyped. It really is just like, like a second flu season. And uh, all these lockdown orders are superfluous and unneeded. And then we see these rise of these absurd right-wing protests, which we'll get to in a second. But, you know, that's kind of a sad irony because the more we succeed at stopping the spread, the more it seems like we overreacted initially. And then you have, you know, in, in some states, uh, the total reopening of the society. And then you're going to see those numbers go higher, the projections go higher and everything go back to shit. And so you'll have a more prolonged fight with this virus because the, the most important thing you could do is preempt it, lock things down, stop the spread, and then be as responsible in, in slowly opening up, maybe intermittently back and forth as you can. Um, but that's not looking like it's going to happen. And so at the very least, I think in some spots around the country, you will see those numbers go way up very quickly as governors uh, get impatient and, and reopen their economies. But we're already talking right now of uh, 40,000 dead Americans, the highest death count of any country in the world, the highest uh, contact, uh, sort of the amount of people that have the virus, higher than any other country in the world. And we have um, one of the worst sort of testing practices of, of countries in the world. So we're under tested and already our numbers are very high. And just to sort of put this in a, in a unit of measurement that Americans can sort of viscerally understand, you're talking about well over a dozen 9-11s worth of dead Americans in a month. And, you know, the, the, the response from the right uh, to 9-11, where just under 3,000 people died compared to the response uh, from the right when it comes to this virus, is just sort of really asymmetrical in sort of absurd, disastrous ways. Um, and then just, the, just to touch on the idea of reopening the economy, Sweden is, is a good test case for this because Sweden is one of those countries that never really went into full lockdown. It really didn't impose anything on its, uh, on its private sector. It let, it let businesses stay open if they wish. But even with, like, let's say, open movie theaters, you have a 90% decline in the amount of people going out to those theaters. So reopening the economy is one thing. But if Americans, or at least the vast majority of Americans, don't believe it's safe to go out, then the economy is not actually actually being reopened. And if you really are ultimately concerned with the economy as such, which I think we'll get into in a little bit, like we are concerned with, with it because a lot of people are suffering, 
the quickest, best, most efficient thing that you could possibly do is take the medical and scientific uh, advice seriously, impose really structured uh, shutdowns, and try to sort of kneecap this this virus and the spread of this virus because if you reopen too early you have a you know these huge spikes in different parts of the country a reintroduction of the viral spread um, you're just making it more of a protracted longer process by which you have to struggle with this coronavirus and you're going to actually end up hurting the economy much more in the long run as hospitals get overwhelmed, businesses shut down, more people become scared. Um, you know, when people are in a panic, you can have things like uh, social unrest, etc. So um, even the, the, the this is the myopic short-sightedness of the U.S. ruling class and the U.S. right when it comes to opening up the economy is really something we're thinking about in and to, to frame these arguments, even the economic argument in this way, because of course we care about people not going into poverty, people not completely losing their jobs, have no ability to pay their rent. We all care about those things. Whether you're a socialist, capitalist, or anything else, a functioning economy of some sort is necessary to people's happiness and safety and health. So that is not a con- that is a concern, but we shouldn't let the right wing and the ruling class um, sort of outflank us on that concern by pretending to be super concerned about the economy when their proposed solutions would only exacerbate and worsen the problem um, for the economy overall, which is, again, another irony but i do want to say like even by the standards of bourgeois states the united states is a total embarrassment there is no real central government whatsoever there is no coordinated response there is no uh, mobilization of the manufacturing and productive capacities of the economy to pump out ventilators or face masks or testing kits in any real concerted centralized way Um, Trump is tossing it all to the governors and then anything bad that happens, he can then blame on individual governors in blue states specifically. Um, So just just understanding that the United States really is a failed state. This is what happens when the Reagan Thatcher ideology just ravages your country for 40 years straight. And then you have a problem that necessitates a strong, efficient, well-organized and well-coordinated government. It's just completely unable to do absolutely anything. And that is why well, America has the absolute worst results of really any country in the in the world. And again, this is the richest, most powerful country in the world. It could easily, if it had a mind to, mobilize its resources in a productive way. It could have easily prepared and laid the foundation for dealing with this problem in a much more um, you know efficient and and rational way. It just chose not to. And and now after 40 years of cutting a bunch of main industries, of stripping the government of funding, of privatizing everything, we just don't have a government. America is in a lot of ways a failed state and that's what we're seeing yeah no i agree and i think like one thing that's important to like that you hinted at that we really need to focus on is this is endemic to the way that capitalism calculates risk right the thing that we've seen over and over again going into this century is that capitalism is not concerned about long-term risk it is concerned about short-term payoffs so when we see the ruling class demanding the economy open back up and when we see their politicians often in the last month and a half basically saying old people should be willing to die for the economy What we're seeing is a total inability to think over the long term, because you're right, if we open the economy up right now, it is not going to save it. Arguably, it is going to make things worse. Even if people do go back to movie theaters and do go back to those businesses, it's going to lead to an increased rate of infection that ultimately is going to lead to a bigger tank in the economy long term and likely, you know, crashing the healthcare industry because it will not be able to handle that increase in infections which is going on. And this is very similar, and I think we need to think about these connections to how the capitalist class has responded to climate change and environmental crisis. They have known since the, you know, later half of the last century that the, you know, the environment is being irreparably destroyed by fossil fuel use and extraction, and that we are moving towards a situation where in the long term those profits will be meaningless because social collapse is very possible. And yet there's no ability to take those long-term calculations into account. Sure, Short-term profit motivations always end up coming first. And so that ultimately leads to us finding ourselves in these crises. And as long as we are working in a system where capitalist profits are the primary consideration for social policy, government, and just sort of broader social cohesion overall, we are going to find ourselves in this kind of situation over and over and over again. The thing that I think is worth saying is there will be more diseases like this. Increased globalization means it is going to happen, and there will be bigger crises too. And what we're seeing is how incapable capitalism is of handling that. But 
one other thing that I think we need to think about in the context of this isn't just that capitalism is incapable of handling it in terms of taking care of its own citizens within a given capitalist state. It also leads to increased lashing out of imperialism. So is very much worth noting that the United States has been stealing medical supplies from other countries. And we're not just talking about countries that are the enemy of the United States on paper. The United States has been intercepting medical supplies which were meant to go to NATO and European Union allies like Germany and France, with Germany referring to our actions as modern piracy. And so what we're seeing as this fails is not just a failure internally, but a lashing out externally, where even the alliances that had been set up in defense of bourgeois capitalism and imperialism globally are fracturing and these states are turning against each other because capitalism has no conception of global solidarity. It has no conception of dealing with a global crisis on a global scale. It simply reverts to watching out for the national interests of a given capitalist class. And that will probably continue to escalate tensions now that we're destroying the alliances that we have with countries who in theory were serving the same class interests that our government was. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's without a doubt that America has the most belligerent, <laughs> a myopic, absurd ruling class of any capitalist um, um, state. It really is the empire in decay um, being shown in, in all of its horrifying anti-glory. Um, and, and we're seeing we're seeing that happen. And you mentioned globalization increasing the, the threat of pandemics. You also have globalization on top of an increasing climate emergency, which climate change in and of itself creates and facilitates the spread of, of pandemics like this. So with climate change heating up the country or the, the world and facilitating the, the growth and spread plus globalization, this is really a dress rehearsal, not just for the broader crisis of climate change, but for future pandemics much like this one. Um, the U.S. has proven that it's utterly unable and in some cases uninterested in, in dealing with this problem in any meaningful way. And even after the dust has settled on this pandemic, I find it really hard to believe that the U.S. ruling class will get its shit together enough to be able to face any future pandemic or the crisis of, of climate change. And maybe that's a good segue into what we're seeing uniquely, I think, in America and perhaps only other country in the world that is like this is Brazil. I haven't seen any other country see what we see in the form of far right wing, hyper conspiracy oriented protests to reopen the economy somehow mixed with with white men reactionaries and full body armor and guns standing outside capitals i can't really make the connection in my mind between what exactly the protest about reopening the economy has to do with larping and full body armor and, and carrying uh, ar-15s to state capitol buildings but that's the american right wing for you um, I do want to talk about this a little bit. One thing that I think is important to note is just how unfucking popular these protests are. The the latest polling coming out yesterday shows that only 10% of Americans um, believe that we should reopen the economy, right? 90% 90 90 of Americans think we should maintain the social distancing measures or increase the measures uh, to protect American lives. So you look at only 10% support, even among Republicans, there's a majority of people not supporting these protests. And so you wonder, how do these s tiny protests um, with virtually no public support pop off in multiple mostly blue states um, around the country. And the only answer to that is because these are not organic grassroots, um, regular working people coming together to rise up and desperately ask for a reopening of the economy. These are astroturfed, um, you know, f funded, organized campaigns by right-wing nonprofits and corporate-backed organizations on the far right. I read one article in Newsweek putting a lot of these protests down to one far right wing family that's engaged in, in really pro gun rhetoric, especially and organizing over like 200 events um, just through that one right wing well off of family alone. And then you look at, I think the question for a Marxist would be, let's, let's examine the class composition of, of these protests. You know, who really composes these protests are these really low income working poor people desperate to get back to work because they're worried about losing their house or not being able to pay rent. And I think one way to to uh, measure what, what the class composition of these protests is, is just by turning on the TV and looking at the sort of vehicles that they drive. And I, I heard a Glenn Greenwald 
a tweet out this week that in Brazil, a similar thing has happened. The, the Bolsonaro far right in Brazil are coming out in their big expensive trucks and their 50,000, 60,000 SUVs with megaphones um, telling people that they want to stop the shutdown and get poor people back to work. And I think when you look at these protests, you see over and over again, 2018, 2019, Dodge Rams, um, you know, f- fully extended cabs. These are not, these are not um, cheap trucks. These are not trucks that working, struggling people are able to afford. This is the sort of well-off suburbanite, um, upper middle class boomer, uh, the the landlord class, um, people that own like yard care or, or lawn work um, companies. It's really this middle strata of, of the bloody, um, dumbed down children of American empire coming out because it's not that they themselves want to go on the front lines and work, right? It's that they want you to get the fuck back to work so that they can go out to their Buffalo Wild Wings, so they can go out golfing, so they can go get their haircuts, so that their convenience, their 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 sense of entitlement at just having a sort of really privileged life premised on just the absolute depravity of American capitalism and imperialism, they're the ones coming out asking you to go the fuck back to work so that they can tip you 2% on a $90 order at Hooters. I mean, these are the people uh, that we're dealing with. And I think understanding just how astroturfed this bullshit is, just how little support it has, and just what substrata of class is actually out there participating in these protests in America and Brazil is incredibly, incredibly revealing. And it is all steeped in this absurd... Um, hyper-individualistic, libertarian idea of only negative freedom exists. And in a lot of ways, it is... I saw that that meme going around where um, one of these protesters had a um, a face mask and it said, my body, my choice. And this is almost like co-opting the rhetoric of, of, of pro-choice um, activists. This is not that logic. This is more the logic of anti-vaxxers. Because in a pro-choice situation, my body, my choice is like, I get to decide what to do with my individual body that has consequences for me and my life. With anti-vaxxers and these protesters, they're saying, I want to be um, not inconvenienced. Who cares who else gets it? You know, I, I can spread it to other people. We know in both the case of not getting vaccinated and in the case of a pandemic, um, not taking your safety seriously, not social distancing doesn't necessarily always puts you at risk it puts other people at risk and this is the sort of petulance and entitlement and just utter narcissism of of the of these people and i think that is absolutely worth pointing out and hammering home yeah no i agree and one thing that i want to talk about a little bit maybe is sort of like the conspiracy theory component that's at play here um because obviously ideologically there is sort of the libertarianism stuff going on but if you look at a lot of the signs from this there's QAnon references uh there's a term that has become popular on the far right of plandemic instead of pandemic as if to indicate that this is some sort of orchestrated plan um and so i wanted to touch a little bit on maybe just like what is happening in terms of those conspiracies and their social function So uh, one podcast that I would recommend, not in terms of their politics, but just in terms of getting a sense of the right, is there's a podcast called Knowledge Fight that's particularly interesting, which is they summarize InfoWars for you so that you don't have to listen to InfoWars. And if you've ever tried to listen to InfoWars, you might appreciate how helpful someone else summarizing it for you is, (laughs) because it is a huge pain in the ass to listen to. But they have sort of been summarizing the response from Alex Jones, who obviously is unfortunately one one of these leaders in sort of the far-right conspiracy world. And it's been interesting sort of to see the utter incoherence at the core of this kind of crypto-fascist libertarian response. So Alex Jones, if we go back to February, was talking about the coronavirus very early on, and his takeaway was that actually this is going to be terrible. So he was saying there's a 15% mortality rate, it's going to kill everyone, it's a Chinese bioweapon meant to destroy the American economy. Um, And that's sort of what he was talking about all the way through March. And so we saw like a sort of sensationalism that was at play there coming from the far right. And probably for many of them, that was just a way of getting profits. Alex Jones makes money off of selling survivalist goods. So it makes sense for him to hype that way. A lot of these right wing grifters operate that way as well. But what's really fascinating to watch, and I think what really speaks to the utter just contradictory incoherence of this kind of fascist thought was that obviously to get from this has a 15% fatality rate to protesting in the street and this plague is 
is not real. Something has to change very radically. And what really occurred there was Trump started changing his rhetoric about reopening the economy and the need to probably just get it over with and allow the economy to happen and the flu being worse and this not being so bad. And overnight, because these fascist sycophants have no option but to fall in line with their leader, you could see Alex Jones flip-flop from there's a 15% death rate to this is no worse than the flu, it's no big deal. The real goal now that the sort of globalists, which as we know is a dog whistle for, you know, it's an anti-Semitic dog whistle, all of a sudden it's the globalists are faking this disease to hurt the American economy and we need to reopen. And so there was a total 180 that happened once Trump's rhetoric really shifted. And I think this speaks to the fact that these sort of conspiracy ideologies, they're not built on anything concrete other than the class interests of the capitalists, right? There's no real belief system there. There's no sense of truth. There's no strong moral convictions. There's only whatever ridiculous justifications need to be put in place in order to justify the ruthless progression of capitalism. And when that shifted to suddenly, no, this is not a big deal, we started to see these protests pop up that are claiming that this virus either is not real or is not particularly dangerous or is less dangerous than the threat to the economy. And so there's an incoherence that is sort of at the core of all fascist ideology. And at the same time, though, I think that when we look at these protests and these conspiracy people, it's important that we don't just brush it off because of that incoherence. One sort of response that you see from the left a lot is like, oh, look at these idiots, how can they believe this? I hope they go get themselves killed. And while I sympathize with that last bit in (laughs) many ways, I I think that we need to think a little more critically about it as well, because these people who are going to these protests aren't going to only get themselves sick, right? They are also going to go out and infect other people. And even though their belief system is totally incoherent and based on irrationality and does appear incredibly stupid, it is a belief system that people will kill in defense of. This idea of a shadowy cabal running the world has been central to fascist movements. The Nazis, of course, very openly blamed the Jews for it, and the fascists in Italy often dog-whistled a little more around blaming the Jews directly, while obviously appealing to European anti-Semitism. And we're seeing that at the core of this movement. If you look at the pictures coming out of the protests in Ohio, one of the most horrifying signs that was being held uh, said the real plague and had a picture of a rat with a Star of David over it. And so there is an anti-Semitic mobilization going on here, and it's beyond just these protests, it is also reflected in Trump's rhetoric. So one thing you may have seen that is absolutely horrifying is that Trump says he's going to sign an executive order to essentially end all legal immigration to the United States for the time being. And while most headlines have picked up on Trump saying this is to protect U.S. jobs, if you look at his tweet, his tweet says, in response to the attacks of the capitalized invisible enemy, uh, with obviously no explanation of who that invisible enemy is, but as always, since he's constantly dog whistling to his fascist followers, we should recognize this is anti-Semitic language language about an invisible cabal controlling the economy and controlling world politics. This is fascist language here. So while there's a ridiculousness to these protests, and they obviously are not an actual grassroots protest, they also, I think, represent an intense uh, sort of increase in fascist rhetoric happening in the U.S. and an armed, mobilized fascist response that we need to take very, very seriously. Yeah, the only thing more intense than the stupidity is the danger that, that they really entail. And if this is their reaction after a month of social distancing, you know, what's their reaction going to be in a future worse pandemic? or in a climate crisis, or even if a Democrat they don't like gets elected during a crisis. I mean, you know, what what is it going to happen if if Biden wins and beats Trump and, you know, these people already steeped and marinated in just untethered from reality conspiracy theories, you know, start thinking that this is a takeover and and their rights and liberties are, are at risk and this is a deep state coup and all the weird shit they talk about. So it is... It is funny and hilarious and absurd, and and they do deserve to be mocked and denigrated just because of how fucking stupid they are. But as, as Allison said, we have to really take seriously just how dangerous these weirdos are as well, just how willing they are to, to lash out and kill and attack um, when their shit really gets pushed against the wall. And I did a recent episode on Rev Left on postmodern conservatism. And it's just a really interesting critique of the sort of reactionaries we see it's precisely in movements like this, um, sort of the, the cultural milieu they come out of, and their inability to ever, ever critique 
um, capitalism and the neoliberal order. And in lieu of being able to even move in the direction of that critique, you have to to balance the cognitive dissidents in some way or another. And conspiracy theories, uh, anti-Semitism, all these things that we're seeing are ways of 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 doing that. And so if anybody's interested in really understanding the psychology and the mindset and the sort of cultural apparatus that these weirdos come out of, uh, check out that recent episode on, on Rev Left. You said something about Alex Jones uh, being sort of cynical in, in, in what he does. And I think that's pretty much been proven uh, through a series of lawsuits uh, that, that came out where I think he was in dispute with his wife or his ex-wife or something. And these things came out that Alex Jones is is playing a character and he knows that the vast majority of the shit that he says is utter bullshit, but he does it because it makes him fucking rich. And he can sell these stupid fucking products and these tactical baths and the, these, you know, these uh, pseudo-scientific uh, solutions to the virus and his people, his fan base, uh, this very same people we see marching around um, are the ones that buy this shit. And so it's very profitable for these hucksters and grifters on the far right to just, you know, plunge these, these, these fools um, for money. And that's exactly what he does. And he lives a life of that, not a happy life. I can't, I mean, he, I think he struggles (laughs) with hardcore alcoholism. He can't really keep his family together. These are not happy, well-adjusted, internally comfortable people. These are, you know, hollow shells of human beings uh, lashing out, and that makes them all the more dangerous. And right now we're seeing this rhetoric come mostly from the from the far-right fringe Infowars types, but there is a direct pipeline from that sort of rhetoric and those media outlets straight to Fox News and people like Donald Trump and right-wing governors and senators and congressmen all over the country. And so right now we see a, a very low support even among Republicans for these weirdos, but if that pipeline really goes the whole way and Fox News once again ramps up the denialism, it already has and it already has since day one. And in some respects, it still is, although in much more subtle ways than perhaps an Alex Jones. But with that pipeline fully gets completed, uh, you're going to see those numbers change. And, and, and that even is, is, is more scary. This is only after one month or, you know, a month and a half, however, wherever you want to set the timeline at, that's only, a, you know, a very short amount of time into this pandemic. All the experts are saying that we have many more months, if not years to go before we're fully in the clear here. And so if this is what's happening after just a month or two, what's going to happen after a year? Um, and so we need to be on the lookout and monitoring these movements um, and trying to to figure out what direction they're moving in because um, while it might seem a little far-fetched at the moment, community self-defense and these or, these formations on the left may become increasingly necessary depending, again, how this pandemic plays out, how the election plays out, and how these uh, fringe conspiracy weirdos react to the events of the time. Uh, so, so definitely keep that in mind. Trump and the, the right wanting to reopen the economy for all the other reasons – um, aside, Trump knows that uh, his presidency hinges not necessarily on his response to the pandemic, but on the economy and the functioning of, of, of the of the stock market. And so that's why Trump, from the very beginning, was hesitant to absolutely do anything. And that's why he is now ready to do anything he can to open it up. The, the narcissism in Trump knows no bounds. He cannot stand the possibility of being a one-term president. He needs that two-term sort of ego boost that comes with it. You know, if we look back on history, a lot of American presidents who are only one-termers are really viewed as second-rate presidents compared to those who had two terms, or in FDR's case, three. Um, so Trump knows damn well where his bread gets buttered and what he has to do. And even though uh, he's so myopic, right, because a, a flubbed, an utterly flubbed response to this pandemic where, you know, people die, especially older people, that's not going to be good for him either. But he doesn't really have the um, the ability, the attention span, the intellectual curiosity or capacity to plan long term in a, in a sort of microcosmic way that the ruling class in America has no ability to plan long term, as Allison uh, was sta- saying earlier. And then just one more uh, point on these protesters, Mm -hmm. Uh, just the psychology of it. Um, These people really do, they conceive of themselves as courageous, brave freedom fighters standing up to a tyrannical government, even though their guy is, is government. So instead of the federal government, now it's blue state governors, but that's neither here nor there. They view themselves as these heroic people. And you listen to Alex Jones talk, he very much views himself as this tough, rugged patriot willing to stand up to uh, interdimensional child molesting aliens or whatever the fuck he's on about. 
But in reality, these people are really the most domesticated, servile, hyper-conditioned um, losers out there, right? They're the most beaten into submission people who will take grifters like Alex Jones's word for things and then go out and actively uh, help somebody like Trump um, do things to the world and to the country that are even actively not in their own long-term interest. So uh, just the, the asymmetry between how these people conceive of themselves and what they actually are is sort of nauseating in, in its own right and, and at least worth gesturing towards. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is truly astounding. They see themselves as these patriot revolutionaries in some yeah. way when they are begging to allow other people, and even for some of them, themselves to die for the economy, which is just an unbelievable thought process. And I think the other thing that I want to touch on a little bit is even though the current class composition of this absolutely is, I think, this middle strata petty bourgeois, we need to be careful about the possibility of it growing. Um, so one thing that I think is important, and I know this is like more our real world than theory episode, but one text that I think everyone needs to read if they get the time is Clara Zetkin's The Struggle Against Fascism. Um, it's a relatively short text. It does a lot of the theoretical work behind that phrase that you always hear, that fascism is capitalism in decay. But one thing that Zetkin gets at that I think is really important for us to wrestle with is that the initial base of these fascist movements is usually petty bourgeois. And it's usually those segments of the petty bourgeoisie who are facing potential proletarianization. So who are having their lives disrupted in such a way that they might lose their status within the petty bourgeoisie and be forced into a proletarian lifestyle. And that creates this intense, almost manic sort of internal freak out and panic for them that we're seeing right now and that we've seen in fascist movements before. But one thing that Zetkin points out that is particularly dangerous is while that class is usually small and does not have that much power compared to other classes, this can spread as the economy gets worse into a larger problem where those who were proletarians are now often pushed into lumpen proletarian positions in crisis from losing Using their jobs and other forms of precarity, which can cause them to be pulled into these kind of panics by this sort of scared and panicking petty bourgeoisie. So oftentimes with fascist developments, while initially there is no actual proletarian participation, as the life of the proletariat breaks down during moments of capitalist crisis, you can see a rank and file start to build for fascist movements. And we need to make sure that we are countering that. And that's not only in terms of sort of anti-fascism and community defense, it's in terms of offering an alternative as the economy likely is going to keep getting worse for workers so that they're not getting pulled into these petty bourgeois fascist formulations. I'd really recommend looking at that Zetkin text because I think it really reflects what's happening in terms of the class composition of things right now. Incredibly important and well said. Uh, that's really important to understand and to keep that in mind as you're watching uh, this stuff develop. And while there is this downward pressure on the middle and the bottom, right, pushing the petty bourgeois into the proletariat and pu pushing the proletariat proper into the lumpen proletariat, while, while that's happening on the middle and lower stratas, at the very, very top, what you're seeing and what you saw in the 2008 Great Recession and what you're going to see now in the economic fallout of this crisis is actually the opposite, uh, the consolidation of, of monopoly power, of wealth, of assets at the very upper echelons of the economic hierarchy in this country. We definitely saw it a lot with the Great Recession. I have a whole episode on Rev Left covering the Great Recession. We spend a good amount of time talking specifically about the consolidation of monopoly power after that. Because what happens in an economic crisis? All of these small businesses, all of these mom and pop capitalist shops that, you know, the, the defenders of capitalism love to say are the backbone of our economy and, and really all about the entrepreneurial spirit. These people are getting fucked. They're, they're, they're losing their businesses. They had in the last coronavirus stimulus package, a small business loan um, funding program that was supposed to try to keep these small businesses afloat during this crisis, it got vultured immediately by huge corporate chains. Um, so that money, when, when the small businesses finally went to try and get that money to keep themselves afloat, there was none, there was none left because the, the, uh, the bigger corporations and the corporate chains who are, who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases, um, usurped all, <laughs> all of that, all of that money, leaving small business people out in, in the cold. And, and you're right. That is a, 
recipe for disaster in a, on a bunch of different fronts. But again, at the very top of society, what we're seeing now, what we've saw in the past is this consolidation of monopoly power. And as a few firms get more and more access and more and more market share, have their hands over more and more wealth and, and property, that relationship with the government becomes even more entrenched because you know those big monopoly corporations then have even more money and more expansive abilities to lobby and to fund campaigns on both parties and to just really dominate the political system like they always have, but in even increased ability uh, to do so. So I think it's really important to, to understand that that is precisely what's happening and that's going to continue to happen. And that just means all of the problems of our society, the inequality, the inability for the government to respond to the people's needs, the leaving out into the cold of poor and working people, um, that's only going to increase because the the very contradiction of the, that, that that underpins the inequality in our society is only dramatically increasing after every recession. And so this really is not only devastating in its own right, but it really shows just how grotesque this economic system is of capitalism. Capitalism has to go through these boom and bust cycles, the anarchy of production. We've covered it a million times, right? And then every time they do, they then solidify and increase the inequality and the contradictions of that society. And in a society like the U.S., um, the settler, colonial, white supremacist, imperial hellscape, um, the, the, the powers that be, the right wing, they're not going away. They're not going to be defeated at the ballot box. They're not going to somehow wake up and have a moral crisis of their own selves and then come to realize that we need to decrease inequality for the long-term well-being of their ability to extract profit. Again, their myopia and their short-sightedness will absolutely never make that a possibility. And so it's really hard for me to believe just broadly in any scenario that sees the United States as it has existed over the past century continuing to exist over the next several decades. I don't see either a, a right-wing sort of reconstitution of their abilities and powers, nor do I see a left-wing taking over like a Bernie Sanders insurgency campaign taking over and implementing social democracy. What I really see as the most likely is increasing balkanization, increasing division, increasing not only balkanization of territory and power structures, but of media narratives and how people relate to their own reality. And so I don't want to be a pessimist here, but I don't really see a lot of good things uh, coming out of that. I think in order to break from American capitalism and the imperial power that it has had for so long, it's going to take sort of a meltdown, a, a disintegration, a breakdown, not a co-option of, of the institutions and a moving in a more healthy, long-term, sustainable um, trajectory. And so I think no matter what we do on the left, all our organizing efforts need to at least keep that in mind. And we, if, if the government and the ruling class and the corporate America don't have the capacity for long-term thinking, then that could possibly be an advantage on our part if we do and we implement every present step with that future in mind. And at least one element of that is, is community self-defense, the formation of, of abilities for the left in any organizing sphere to be able to defend its projects going forward because the pressure that we're going to get is only going to increase as the society overall breaks down. Absolutely. And I think that balkanization point is incredibly, uh, you know, insightful, because there's no way that I see us coming out of this with the 50 states more unified than they were before. And we see that in multiple ways, right? On one level, I mean, you can look at the way that California, Washington, and Oregon, as three states basically made an agreement that they were going to have their own response to the coronavirus that was going to be a joint agreement between the three of them without the input of the rest of the states, and that was willing to ignore federal government advice. If that's not the beginning of sort of a soft balkanization, then it's hard to say what is. And, you know, people have made a lot out of it, but I also don't think it's worth rejecting the language that Gavin Newsom has started to use referring to California as a nation state and referring to aid that California is giving to other states as exports, uh, sort of at least rhetorically represents in the mind of state leadership a distancing from the rest of the country. And one level to that that I think will be interesting to see play out is with some states insisting on continuing lockdown and other states, you know, sort of loosening up if we're going to try to see restrictions of travel across state lines from various states as they have disagreements about what levels of safety ought to happen. There is just clear and absolute fracturing that's occurring here and that I think is very likely to happen. I, I agree that I can't in my mind picture, you know, 40 years from now, the United States still existing as it existed last year. 
I just don't know what that would look like. And it does seem like we are probably going into a very bad direction. And I think that economically, like, we emphasized this last time, but we're still seeing things go particularly towards a depression. We are still looking at plus 30% unemployment, which is historically unprecedented. What that will do to the country is almost hard to wrap your mind around, and even mainstream economists are scrambling to try to figure out what that means over the long term. But now we're also watching industry collapse. We have Richard Branson of Virgin Atlantic, the airline company, saying that they are on the verge of bankruptcy if they don't get a bailout, and there's no clear sign of bailouts on the way. We have the cruise industry saying the same thing, and then as of yesterday, we have oil reaching a penny a barrel, which will in very many ways hurt the oil industry itself and could lead to potential bankruptcy there. And I don't think that, you know, I've seen some leftists take a celebratory tone towards, like, these industries are finally collapsing, but I think what you're saying, Brett, is more likely. We will see monopolization come out of this. Rather than the collapse of these industries, we will see these various companies who are struggling independently probably consolidate under this time period, and we will come out with a reconstituted and restructured capitalist industry at the top. And we as leftists need to figure out how we're going to survive and how we're going to help other people survive the very intense difficulties that that period of economic, I think likely chaos, is going to bring about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not some hard economic you know, policy to understand why this consolidation would happen. You have smaller businesses that don't have a lot of excess capital. And when you don't have customers coming in, you have high overhead costs for a lot of small businesses, bars, restaurants, etc. You have an inability to weather the crisis. Huge corporations with, you know, billions and billions of dollars in reserve and profits and close connections to, to banking and finance institutions have the ability to weather the storm. Then the crisis passes. All those small businesses and all really the real estate property that they once held are all now gone and defunct. And these big corporations like a Blackstone, a real, a huge real estate development company will come in, buy up all that shit, can increase gentrification, right? In the oil industry, we see smaller oil producers and stuff going under, not being able to stand up to the drop in oil prices, whereas super big companies will be able to buy them up. And in banking and finance, the same basic process is happening. You also mentioned unemployment and the inability for the government to do anything meaningful to to stop this sort of this sort of collapse. And just anecdotally, you know, my wife uh, lost her job a month ago, right? Filed for unemployment a month ago, still has not received anything back, has not even heard back about what the status of her unemployment is. That's that's in our family here. That's happening all over the country. And a and part of this is that conservative red states here in Nebraska, Florida is another example. I'm sure even in blue states this happens, where any sort of a social program, social safety net, including and especially stuff like employment, is set up in such a way as to disincentivize you from doing it in the first place because of the bureaucratic red tape and the labyrinthine construction of these policies and programs are. So there's a huge sort of barrier to entry to even begin pursuing these social um, safety net policies and programs. And then there's a constant rechecking up and, and anything they do to throw you off. When we had our, our son and he was uh, very young, he was on uh, Medicaid, And every month we would get new paperwork to fill out asking questions about jobs we had years and years and years ago that we don't even remember the boss's name, let alone what number to put down for them to contact. And this is all just a really conservative right wing attempt. And it has been for decades and decades to make these programs as inaccessible as possible. And then a pandemic like this hits tens of millions of Americans are now unemployed through literally no fault of their own, and they can't even access these programs. So a stimulus bill that expands unemployment. Awesome. It sounds good on paper. It makes sense. But when you can't even access the, the, the programs, then it is fucking meaningless and it shouldn't, it's, it's, it's in effect, it wasn't even anything at all, right? In effect, the stimulus un, 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 unemployment expansion didn't even happen for the vast majority of Americans right now trying to get unemployment because you can't even fucking hear back from them. I had another friend trying to apply for unemployment. They were literally telling her that she had jobs in the past five years in cities she had never been. And she would ask, like, I never worked at this place. I never even had a job in this city. And they said, well, if you didn't, then it wouldn't be in our record. (laughs) And, you know, and you understand the lady on the other, on the other line is probably dealing with a bunch of bullshit. She's just a worker herself. And she probably has her own um, annoyances and stuff. And the, the architects of this bullshit, the vampires that, that, that did this, uh, they're nowhere to be seen. They will never have to take a call 
from an unemployed person desperately seeking assistance in this time. And so it really just re- exposes not only the contradictions, but the rotten motherfucking villains that run this society and have run this society for decades. Yeah, no, and I mean, it's definitely true in blue states as well. Even before the pandemic, we were going through the unemployment process this summer, my family was, and the utter lack of ability to just communicate with anyone, them telling you all this information that is incorrect, which is an experience that we also had, and having no way to really appeal it, to talk to anyone, we were getting hung up on on the phone uh, oh when we were trying to just get through the process. The amount of paperwork in California, one of the bluest states in the country, was also astounding, and I cannot even imagine working through that right now in the context of this virus like under normal operations it was just so clear every step of the way that the process was designed to be difficult obtuse and to get you to stop your application exactly right well i think we covered that um segment for now do you want to move on to to some organizing talk Yeah, yeah. So one thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is some of the work that, you know, communists are doing around the United States right now. Um, Because, like, obviously, we're talking about some heavy shit. (laughs) So far, this episode has not been super, uh, you know, optimistic in a lot of ways. And that's because we're operating in grave times. This is, frankly, a fucking world historical crisis that we are operating in. And those are always scary times. Uh, So I want to take a little bit of time and talk about work that is being done. Because the one thing that is making me feel hopeful right now is that we are seeing a massive mobilization of work. So I I just want to highlight the work of a few different groups. Um, So the For the People Network, who I've talked about before, they have chapters all over the country who've been different, doing different work. But some of the stuff that I think has been particularly inspiring to see has been in Chicago and Boston, a fair amount of food distribution going on to families who are in need. One of the really cool projects coming out of St. Louis has been acquiring a 3D printer and 3D printing masks that can take a HEPA filter insert for distribution, which I think is just an incredible level of creativity in response to this crisis. And there has also been a move to reclaim public lots that were abandoned in order to start using them to grow food because no one's paying attention to that right now. And obviously now is a time where we can take actions like that and gain the ability to build infrastructure. Uh, The Philadelphia chapter also, you know, has been doing work to raise funds to pay for people's medications because a lot of people have lost their jobs and lost their insurance right now. And there are desperate people who without insulin, for example, will die. And there are communists who are beginning to fill in there. Um, In Philadelphia also, there's groups like Philly Social who have done a really insizable amount of mutual aid work that's occurring right now, as well as doing tenants organizing and helping with the Autonomous Tenants Union network. So there really is a move going on to fill these gaps. Here in California, the People's Revolutionary Party Long Beach, who I've had the privilege of working with during this time period, has been doing food distribution in Long Beach, Boyle Heights, and South Central, going to the projects, making sure that families who don't have the ability to get groceries right now are being fed, are getting literature, and are getting propaganda talking about why this is not their fault. This is the fault of a capitalist society that has failed them and giving ways to encourage them to go on and do more work. Uh, We've built a hand sanitizer station that we had placed in uh, camps for unhoused people so that they could have some basic hygiene sanitation. The city, of course, destroyed it and the police removed it because they don't give a fuck about the public health of people in their city, only about vilifying and marginalizing unhoused people. And we've been doing all sorts of work also around feeding unhoused communities. If you look all around the country, you can see people who are stepping in not only to provide mutual aid that meets people's needs, but to provide a politicization of the situation, to point out that what is happening is a crisis of capitalism, that there are people we can put the blame on, there is a class we can point to, and, you know, to try to unify communities around organizing in response and opposition to them. Some of the tenant work happening around the country is creating direct confrontation between workers and landlords and building actual, really, like, visible class enmity between these two groups, and a recognition that working class tenants have to have each other's back in these struggles against the capitalists. So as bad as things look right now, if we look around the country, there is work being done that is building the beginnings of working class consciousness raising and politicization. And we need to ramp the scale of that up immensely in order to respond to this, you know, emerging fascist movement that is going to try to be appealing for the support of these same people. We have a better narrative. We have the truth on our side. The fact that materialism can explain people's experiences to them in the way that some bullshit conspiracy theory never can. And it's important that we do the work that builds connections with the masses so that we can create that politicization. And some of that is happening now. And my hope absolutely is that we will see it continue as this crisis continues. 
Absolutely. Beautifully said. I echo all of those sentiments. I know some of the comrades in FTP Chicago, they're doing great work. FTP here in Omaha is continually doing their work. Um, WHOA, WO in the Carolinas with uh, my comrade Cameron doing amazing work. Um, even stuff, Amazon, right? These uh, the, the protests surrounding like uh, the, the Amazon worker, Chris Smalls, I think his name is, who helped orchestrate an Amazon walkout and protest, got fired for it. Um, and, and Amazon upper brass was saying that he is uh, inarticulate and, and dumb and he should be the focus of the organizing effort, just revealing their ghastliness, a, a, a deeply articulate, intelligent, beautiful human being. Like, I listened to uh, his interview on The Intercept and it brought me to tears just because this is not, um, in this case, a, a radical left communist socialist who has been in this milieu for, for decades. It's just a regular worker with a family who saw the depravities happening in Amazon warehouses, cared about his co-workers, and stood the fuck up and did something about it and got fired for his trouble. Um, so if you haven't listened to that uh, episode on The Intercept, I would encourage it because it's just a one-on-one -on -one interview with the, with the lead organizer of that big Amazon uh, strike. Um, but broadly, I'm doing a sub-series on Rev Left right now called Organizing in a Pandemic, and we're interviewing just different organizations and groups around the country um, right now. We already have two up. I think two more are coming. So if you're interested in, in hearing more of that, and importantly, um, if you're looking for tips on how you might be able to get started organizing or expand your organizing, especially if you want to focus on rent strikes and tenant organizing in these crises, I would definitely point you to that ongoing sub-series where we have already have two episodes out, including one episode dedicated to just what's going on here in my organizations uh, here in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, so definitely check that out if you want to learn more. There's so much going on, so much that even Allison and I are unaware of because shit is popping off so quickly and on every corner of the country. It's it's a sign of of of, of goodness. It's it's a uh, it's a silver lining. It's something that we should promote and help expand and be optimistic about because while the right is blocking traffic and carrying guns and wearing their costumes, um, the left is making sure people have food, aren't getting fucked over by their landlords, have access to hand sanitizer and and basic necessities. And and that um, that dichotomy that split. Uh, is really stark. And if we can point it out, if we can emphasize it, um, we can do a lot of work in destigmatizing uh, words like socialism and communism in this crucial time and bring people over to our sides, not through jargon and online rhetoric and arguments and debates, but through actual on the ground organizing, helping people's basic material reality in a moment of crisis. That does more in a single day than a million debates on Facebook or Twitter will ever do. So anybody out there engaged in it, Keep up the amazing work. You are in our hearts for damn sure. And uh, we'll continue to amplify uh, those struggles and participate in them ourselves. Definitely. And the thing that I would encourage people to is if you are sitting somewhere where you don't see this organizing happening and you want to help make it happen, reach out to some of these groups that are doing it. The amount of resources that are available to you where people will give you information on how they've set up the infrastructure, how they've done the fundraising, you would be honestly surprised. Organizers are often very excited to share that information and it is totally possible for you to get the resources that you need to start doing this work as well. Definitely. All right, so we're over an hour. Um, I still have one more big topic to, to tackle if you want to tackle it with me, and it's sort of totally. a bunch of little topics pushed into one. But just generally, um, and maybe you can start this, your general thoughts on the election, Bernie dropping out, endorsing Biden, whether or not uh, people should vote for Biden is a big controversy <laughs> online right now. The Chomsky um, quote of Chomsky just doing what he's always done. I, I don't really understand. Yeah. I don't really understand the outrage because it's like Chomsky's always done this. It's like, of course, you expected him to do this. Bernie dropping out <laughs> and endorsing Biden is not surprising to me at all. Like the whole outrage about Bernie and, and Chomsky seems sort of overwrought in its in its uh, blindness because like of course both these things were going to happen it was never a question in my mind at all and so I don't know it's still maybe worth throwing those critiques out there for newer leftists coming up or whatever but just generally I guess what are your thoughts on this whole um, set of, of issues yeah so you know uh, w one thing that I've been trying to frame all of my thoughts on the election side of things uh, ha has really just been uh, for compassion uh, towards people who are hurting right now so y you all know I 
did not like the Bernie strategy. I have not been a supporter of the Bernie strategy. I've been fairly vocally critical of it uh, fairly consistently. But one thing that I've seen is that a lot of working people I know who were invested in that strategy, and I'm not talking like socialist ideologues, I'm talking like friends I've had for a lot of my life who are working class and barely getting by, are like fucking devastated right now yeah. because they had hoped that they were going to get relief in terms of medical care. We're going to get relief in terms of, you know, all of these things like loans, and now they're not. And now they don't know what their future looks like. So what I've been trying to frame everything through is a real compassion for, like, the fear that people are experiencing in the wake of the Bernie dropout. Um, You know, and and not coming across as condescending or I told you so in any way, because it sucks. People were invested in that, and now it's not happening, and that puts people in a scary place. Uh, my, My main focus has been, I don't think it's surprising surprising whatsoever that Bernie dropped out and endorsed Biden. That's sort of all he could and would do at this point in the primary. I do think it's worth politicizing, though, that, you know, Bernie didn't have to do it in a sense. Uh, The way that one comrade put it and that I wrote about in a recent piece is like, Bernie is not going to get to run for president again, not at this age. It's over for him. He has a good life. He has a family. He's set up. They have enough money. If he wanted to, he could have broken with the Democratic Party in this moment, and he chose not to. And that doesn't surprise me whatsoever. I don't think that I could have conceptualized him breaking with it. But it's possible that he could have, and he didn't. And I think that that is a testament to just the absolute hegemony of the Democratic Party and its ability to pull even those who dissent within it back in time and time again. And I hope that what people will learn from this is that the Democratic Party has to be broken from and has to be left in the dust. And frankly, we have to do everything we can to reduce its influence influence as much as possible. Even Bernie, who people had put their hope in, was not able to break with it in the end, and I don't know why we would think that anyone else would be able to ever. The focus of that party is to consolidate capitalism and imperialism, and it has to be defeated and overcome within the left, and I think that's one takeaway we need to have. Um, In terms of the Chomsky thing, I don't know. Chomsky is Chomsky, right? Um, I've just never really been a fan of him, and it does not surprise me coming from him at all that that's his position. And at this point, you know, he's, in my mind, just kind of another old man on the left who wrote some good stuff at a few points, but also, you know, is out of touch with a lot of the actual on-the-ground struggle that's being waged around the country right now. And I just wouldn't give him too much thought is kind of how I look at that. Uh, In terms of Biden overall, my takeaway that I've been encouraging everyone is not to vote for Biden and to go out of their way to not vote for Biden. I think that Biden is not the lesser of two evils as far as I'm concerned, and I think that if you want a very uh, concrete example of why that's case, you should watch his most recent attack ad on Trump, Mm -hmm. where his criticism of Trump around the coronavirus is not about some of the very obvious mistakes Trump has made, like pushing hydrochloroquine or, you know, pushing conspiracy theories or having defunded the CDC pandemic team prior to this. It's about the fact that Trump hasn't been harsh enough on China, and it goes beyond you know, the old imperialist saber rattling of, oh, we need to be harsh on China and Russia or whatever, it actually steps into individualized racism against Chinese people, because one of the claims that the Biden ad makes is that Trump got more Americans sick by allowing Chinese people to come into the country. That is not an attack on the government of China. That is not an attack on the U.S.'s geopolitical enemy as a political entity overseas. That is an attack on Chinese people here in the United States from the Democratic president who's using racist fear-mongering to spread yellow peril panic that will result in Chinese people facing increased hate crimes. So Joseph Biden is not, in my mind, the lesser of two evils. He is flanking Trump from the right right now, and his criticism of Trump, in essence, is that he's not racist enough. So from my perspective, at least, I see no reason whatsoever to believe that Joseph Biden is the lesser of two evils or is a harm reduction choice. He is just as bad as Trump and will just do what Trump has been doing with a smiley face, and I don't think that that is any better. The job now is to consolidate our power external to the Democratic Party, external to the sort of para-party, non-governmental organization sort of sphere that exists around it, and to build real independent working class power. And that means not only refusing to vote for Biden, but pointing out the fact that he himself is now positioning himself as a fascist, racist asshole, and that this shows ultimately the truth that when capitalism goes into crisis, it falls back on this fascist rhetoric, and that our choice is between that fascism or socialism, and we will give the socialist option. Amen. Could not agree more. You're going to hear a lot of podcasts on the ostensible left say stuff like this. 
well, I won't vote for Biden personally, but, you know, that's up to you and your own conscience. It's not a big deal. Everybody, you know, you can make your own decision on that. Fuck that. I say straight up, you have a moral obligation to not only not vote for him yourself, but to tell other people not to vote for him. This is not our circus. These these two parties do not represent working class interests. They don't believe in what we believe in. They spent the last year shitting on the only candidate that was even sort of close to being anything nice for working people. Tepid, tepid, weak, spineless social democracy was even too much for them to take. And now not only do they want you to go and vote for their shitty fucking corpse of a candidate, but they will turn around and call you privileged if they don't. The same people, mind you, that were saying Bernie is anti-Semitic, Bernie is a sexist, Bernie is a racist. The moment they get presented with their own hardcore racist sexist with decades and decades of institutional racist policies and a credible rape allegation, the whole Me Too movement, the entire identity politics apparatus is immediately jettisoned and the only shell of a, of a thing they have have left is just the words, the rhetoric of intersectionality, like the word privileged. If you don't vote for Biden, you are privileged. These people are fucking shameless. You do not owe these motherfuckers anything. Don't give me any arguments about harm reduction. We've heard it our entire lives. Um, I'm so sick of every four years hearing the same exact arguments um, as if they're new, as if these people presenting them have, have just come up with them in their own infinite intellectual capacity to think through political strategy. It's the same shit where I heard every election of my life. This is the biggest election of your life. You have to vote for the lesser of two evils. This is all about harm reduction. And if you don't do it, you're privileged. That is a played out bullshit ass rhetoric um, apparatus they're trying to throw on us yet again. It needs to be rejected by all principled comrades and communists and socialists. There is no future in electoralism. Bernie Sanders, regardless of where you stood on the issue, might have been the last chance for something like an off-ramp when it came to U.S. electoralism. Um, and even that, like Allison has always been, I was even a little more optimistic than Allison. She's always been against the shit and calling it out from day one. But now all of those disputes are completely settled. The Democratic Party is nothing else but an enemy. Um, that needs to be combated and every ounce of time, energy, funding, and organizing that we partake in needs to take place not only outside the Democratic Party, but within the framework of understanding the Democratic Party as an antagonistic contradiction at this mm -hmm. point in the game. Um, we don't have decades and decades to build up an electoral coalition to take over governor mansions and, and the presidency and congresswomen and um, the Democratic socialist strategy. It's all fucked. It's all done. That's the death nail. Um, we have to organize dual power, community self-defense, our own ability to provide for our class outside of these rotten, decaying, decrepit structures. And anybody that tells you anything other than that is selling you a bill of goods and they need to be rejected wholesale. And I think one thing I want to emphasize is we need to take the moral high ground here because we have it. It's time to stop apologizing to Democrats and liberals. When they try to shame you for not voting, when they call you privileged, when they try to gaslight you about this shit, I think the important thing that the left needs to start doing is not play defense on like, oh, here's why, like, in this case, it's okay for me to abstain. I want you to respond with, no, fuck you. Mm -hmm. How can you vote for a racist? How can you vote for a very likely rapist? How can you vote for this fucking creep? Turn the moral game on its head. Put them on the defensive. Make them justify why they're okay with racism, with sexism, with misogyny, and sexual assault. Change the narrative so that we're no longer the ones playing catch-up defending ourselves from these accusations, but the accusations are coming rightfully from the left, the putrid fucking corpse of the Democratic Party and its coward supporters, and make them justify their fucked up actions instead of playing defense. Because right now, we have the moral high ground. They have picked the worst fucking candidate they could possibly pick, and they should be punished for it, and it should hurt them. And you should not tolerate being shamed, being called out, being attacked by liberals that you know. You should turn that right back on them. Now is the time to make this more antagonistic and to shift it in our favor. Yeah, and don't ever fall for this bullshit idea that, well, Bernie just lost and the voters wanted Biden. We know that's nonsense. We know the media narrative out of CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times from day one against Bernie. We know for a fact that fucking Obama was behind the scenes orchestrating the dropout of Buttigieg and Klobuchar and the consolidation behind um, Biden because Obama... 
uh, as much as he wants to present himself as this progressive uh, figure in American politics, is more interested in his own legacy than he is in advancing um, the material conditions of working and poor people or any values that they, these motherfuckers pretend to stand for, throwing it right out the window because Obama knows that if Bernie got in, he would take the Democratic Party in a direction that is not conducive with what Obama did in his eight years, and that then will reflect badly looking back in retrospect on Obama. So Obama is a fucking cretin. Biden is a fucking cretin. All these people on Twitter, all these talking heads, the Mehdi Hassans of the world out there trying to, to, to browbeat you and shame you into voting for a Republican even though he calls himself a Democrat. In any sane world, Biden would represent the far, far right of a reasonable political spectrum. And these people are calling you privileged if you don't get in that voting booth and vote for him, even after all the shit they've done to the socialist and even social democratic left in this country. It's a fucking joke. These people deserve nothing from you. Fuck them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Allison and I are uh, in complete agreement on that front. <laughs> and then, yeah, no, definitely. Really quick, though, just on the China thing. I mean... Amen to everything you said. Amen to the idea that it is we're already seeing hate crimes against Asian Americans. That's only going to increase. The The Democrats are going right. They're attacking um, Trump on not being hard enough on China. The American ruling class in crisis. This is, a, this is as old as, as the country itself. When you're in a real economic crisis, you cannot point your finger and aim anger and resentment towards the ruling class, towards the actual institutions and people and power structures that create this problem and foment these conditions. You have to have a scapegoat. And Democrats themselves are even playing that game by pointing to China, ramping up a Cold War 2.0 against China and trying to divert our attention from them and their their proxies, their donor class, their politicians, and focus it on not even just, as Allison said, the Chinese government, but on Asian Americans and just Chinese citizens broadly. A disgusting, right-wing, reactionary, racist, crypto-fascist move. And that's what the Democrats want you to vote for? Absurd. Absurd. Get out of my face with that shit. (laughs) Yeah, no, honestly. I mean, they're showing their hand, you know, and we need to be able to put something better out there. Definitely. All right, well, that covers all of of my notes for today's episode. Is there any last things that you want to say? And then if not, you can go ahead and take us to the outro. Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to say, I think, is like, uh, you know, again, in terms of the organizing that's going on, one thing that I really want to emphasize is I think we need to think really big here, right? Now is the time for really intense strategizing about how we move forward. I think that, like, I'm fucking blown away by the amount of mutual aid work that's happening and by the amount of tenants organizing that's happening by the amount of stuff that's being done but also when i look at the history of mutual aid work look at the history of some of these forms of organizing i think that like one thing that's sort of up in the air for me is that we've seen this in the past right there have been times like hurricane katrina where in the south especially anarchists who really deserve a shout out for some of the work they did organized huge mutual aid responses and one of the problem though is that once that crisis was resolved those sort of organizational networks and infrastructure didn't necessarily stick around right and to some extent there is some remaining like aspects of that the current mutual aid disaster relief can kind of trace its lineage to that, but a sort of broader structure went away. And so one thing that I want us to keep in mind as we're all as socialists developing our strategy in response to this pandemic is it's not enough to build mutual aid networks that are going to just feed people while, you know, like this crisis goes on. Because at some point we'll have the vaccine probably way too far from now and things will return to not normal, but something more normal. And if we just stop doing the work then, then we have failed. Our job now needs to be to take this work and not just meet people's needs, but to politicize the crisis, to explain their needs to them politically and to pull them into broader organizing networks that will last long term so that between this crisis and the next one, we will still have a rank and file membership that we recruited during this crisis who are ready to work during the next one and so that we can continue to build power. It's important, I think, that we don't come out of this with a bunch of local organizations with no plan on how to move forward with a national strategy as socialists and with no plan for how to survive in the interim between whatever, you know, the next crisis is in this one. We need to be moving towards unity. We need to be moving towards a fucking party. And that means strategizing big, talking with other socialists around the country, building forms of communication, sharing resources, sharing ideas, sharing what you've done that's worked with them, getting their input, and building the connections that will make this a lasting political response, not just one sort of economistic band-aid in the moment of most intense crisis. We need to be laying the groundwork for a greater party to emerge from this. 
Absolutely. And we're going to do everything we can in our own organizing circles as well as on our platforms to push that idea and continue to amplify those efforts to consolidate, increase organization and have a national strategy um, and work towards the, the, the creation of a party. Because it's one thing to have a crisis when you just have a bunch of decentralized, autonomous, unconnected organizations all over the country. It's quite another to have something like an organized, cooperative um, movement that can that can cooperate rate, can shift funds around, can have some discipline in the way they organize, and, and some long-term strategic thinking. Those are two very different um, sort of base points from which to address and tackle the upcoming crises in the future. And I hope if we learn anything from this crisis, it's that we need to do exactly what Allison said and at least move in that direction as much as we possibly can in our own spheres of influence. Definitely. So thank you so much for tuning in. You know, we did our last episode on COVID discussing this, and obviously it seems necessary to update the situation. The world is changing very rapidly. And like Brad said at the intro, we are obviously going to be alternating now back and forth between this kind of episode and the theory. We think both of those things are valuable. Our ability to do this kind of episode is improved by our ability to do theoretical development together and with you. And so we'll be continuing to provide both of those things. If you like what we're doing, you can check us out on Twitter. Twitter, as always at red underscore minutes underscore pod and we are also on patreon where if you'd like you can support us on patreon.com slash the red menace it means a lot to us and it helps us continue to do this work and we want to continue to be a platform to raise theoretical education that can help you go out and do organizing work and to be able to boost information that we all need as a movement in order to formulate a response it's an honor to have you all even just listening to our ideas during a time as intense as this and i at least am incredibly thankful for all of your support and for all of you as listeners and i hope that together we can find a way to overcome this very fucking dire situation that we're in solidarity